Okay guys, so in this DVD what we're going to be looking at is uh, some further questions as to what happens when the core game plan breaks down. Uh, Danny Wanagat, the crazy monkey instructor, and Heiko Han of CombativeCrossTraining.com have asked some really good questions we're going to look at that today. Um, I've got uh, Y Men in because um, Raj is a little bit smaller than me as you might have noticed and the question I've been asked for today is how would you deal with somebody who's the same size and strength as you who've been trained the same, to do the same things as you? So we'll look at that, we'll look at that in sequence. The first thing that Danny asked me was what would you do in a scenario where somebody was using a fence against you? For example, if somebody had actually put up a fence and then was dragging a child away into the car and the first guy is trying to stop you as the second guy is dragging your child away. Okay, I'll explain how to deal with that. Could you just stand with your hands up like this? Why men's not done any of this training before, which is good because that means we can walk him through it and you can see what it's like. So this is the classic fence stance, either here or here. The preemptive strike that most people are training off usually is just a right cross, which is just a right punch straight into the jaw. It's a trick though guys, it's not magic, there's nothing, everything that I show you is based on physiological and psychological tricks. It's good solid, it's good solid ergonomic work and it will function but it's still a trick. This, to the uninitiated, is a way for him not knowing that you're getting ready to hit him. That's what offence is. Him doing this with his hands is like him going, listen mate, calm down. So that when I'm switched off, he can then bang and punch with that right cross and knock me out. That's the idea of offence. Somebody's got his hands up in a fence, just fucking ignore it. Just so, you know, you know what he's doing. You're not the uninitiated. You can see that this is a trick. The, this fantasy scenario, which sounds something like Liam Neeson in Taken, it's a pretty cool idea, I guess, for a scenario, is the kid's being taken away, very dramatic. You've got to get through this guy. Fuck the fact he's got a fence up. It's fucking smashed through. The same way you would as if he was trying to hit you or stab you or pull a gun on you. You've got to use preemptive movement and your violent intent must exceed his. If, um, if I'm the guy who's using the fence and why men's trying to come through me and I'm saying, listen mate, stay back, stay back, stay back, like this, it shouldn't make any difference whatsoever. The fact that I've got my hands out and I'm verbally engaging with you is irrelevant. you just got to go through him. If you put your hands up in the fence again. Now, the technical, you know, like I said to you last time, it's more important to know what to do than how to do it. The what to do is I'm going to smash through this guy. Whatever it takes, I'm going to get him out of the way, I'm going to take him down and move through to the next objective. The how to do it is not that important. But we've already looked at, what does this look like? This looks like when somebody gets hit and they turn away. Could you just do this for a second? So if I've already hit him and he's turned away, it's very, very similar. They're the same principles. The guy doesn't want me to hurt him anymore, so he moves and turns away. So what do we have to do? Put your hands up in a fence. We've got to clear the limbs. And just do the simplest, most brutal, savage thing possible to hurt the other human being to inflict injury on him, whatever it is. It might even be faking that you're going to do something with his hands, slapping into the hands and then driving a kick into the groin. Or, if you put your hands up again, smashing through here, driving through with the head. The how doesn't really matter, it's the what that counts. Drive through him, disregard the fence. It's actually, to be honest with you, not only is this a trick, I now consider it, that was developed in uh, the late 90s and at the time by Jeff Thompson, he coined the term the fence. It was seen in FBI field manuals where they were talking about the interview stance. Other people were talking about it as well. As tricks go, I think it's a bit of a cheap trick. I don't think anybody is particularly fooled by this. My recent experiences on the door, when I actually did a classic fence with people, their immediate response was, what the fuck are you doing with your hands? This is not subtle. This is not that subtle. And if I'm going to do this and go and make my fence so broad and open, then I may as well not have a fence at all. That's why a few years ago I came out with the SCTS concept, the socially camouflaged targeting strategy, so you just target the guy to do something offensive towards him and don't worry about what you're doing with your hands. Shouldn't really be fooling anybody. If you've got proper violence intent, you just go through him. This leads on nicely to that question of how would Richie deal with Richie? Well, because I'm a bit of a cunt, if I was going to fight with somebody, this fence thing is a bridge between the psychological and the physical, is it not? Yes. So we need another bridge between the psychological and the physical. 
I would go one of two ways with you if I was trying to hurt you. I would either try and lull you into a false sense of security by friending you up, by making kinesthetic contact with you, trying to get you to feel comfortable with me being in close, and going, listen mate, we don't need to fight, we'll let those other cunts fight, bang, and then smashing in. That's one way. Or the other cunt's trick is to be so aggressive and so explosive, fucking cunt, I'm going to kill you, to try and get that rabbit in the headlights effect of, oh shit, so that you shock the guy and then you smash him. How, do, how would I defend against that? I've defended against that loads of times because there's loads of guys out there who know those tricks. They're fairly standard tricks. They're just cunt's tricks. You can't get sucked into the other person's social reality. So say, for example, why men's on the door and he's standing like a doorman right now, which is great. And somebody's in front of him and they decide to use one of these tricks with him. I'm going to tell you what to do and then you can figure out how to do it, the specific details yourself. He simply, as a doorman, dealing with somebody being shitty with him, who's drunk, who's high, whatever, his whole objective is not to get sucked into my reality. So if I'm being super aggressive, are you fucking con? I'm going to fucking stab you, I'm going to kill you, he is not allowed to react. If I'm going, listen mate, I don't want any trouble, blah, 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 he's also not allowed to react, but he's not allowed to let me touch him. Which is the game that we play on the door all the time. If you go to put your hand on my shoulder, where you're going, listen mate, if you want to talk to me, talk to me from there. You never let somebody put their hands higher than yours, and you never let them put their arm around you. Ever 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 it's, um, phys- it's a physically dominating thing to do and psychologically they're attempting to dominate you as well so that's the psychological to the physical realm somebody throws a fence up fuck his fence smash him just go right the way through him all the fence is is if you think about it we mentioned combat shooting last time all the fence is is this that's all it is it's not magic it's only magic to the un- uninitiated. All I'm doing is going fucking hell and preparing to draw and shoot. This is a prepare to draw and shoot. That's all it is. So just go through it. The other question that Danny asked was, how would I get through the guy's flinch? Um, another guy flinching in front of me is of no threat. A flinch is this. So if somebody goes, I'm just going to go, yeah, all right. I presume what Danny means is a flinch that's been converted into some kind of a GCR or like Tony Blower's spear. Again, it's here. The GCR and the spear, same thing. Could you come into this position? This is a good stress response against the average street thug, okay? Get, getting your hands up, you don't know what's happening, you might possibly, um, what Tony tries to do is get outside 90, you smash the forearm into the neck and you actually stop the guy for a second. What I've told you to do, go back again, is similar to that, but I've said try and get your hand to smash into the guy's face. So if I'm coming forward to hit him and his hands instinctively go up, I end up actually spearing my own face onto his hand. But that's for a thug who's attacking a guy who is, it's an asymmetric attack. I'm attacking him in an ambush attack because I think he's not ready, because I think it's going to be a quick and easy kill. He's now reversing it on me, if you throw that position up again, I'm not expecting this, okay? As a martial artist though, if somebody does this to you, and you actually, well, why would you be hitting somebody and ambushing them? If you're a decent human being watching this DVD, why are you the cunt in the scenario who's come round the side to smash him round the head? That wouldn't happen, right? Also, if that, if that hand goes up as you've gone in, this is not really the most martial arts stopping of techniques, is it? To just be here, it's got to flow into something else. I would say the other um, common untrained street attack of grabbing the lapels, way more hassle than that, because if he throws that up, it's only a case of, right, okay, let's just deal with the, I'm not going to get too deep into the technicalities here. This limb, what are my options here? Let's take it upward. If I simply choose to take it upward, I can then slide straight in for a side choke and a takedown. Let's not choose to take it upward, let us choose to take it downward. What happens there? Pax out, plops out, smash into the fucking face again. Just drag it down. Those are two options for you guys. Take it up, take it down. What did I tell you on the last DVD and what have I been saying pretty much through every tutorial this year? Put your hands up again, sorry. Clear the limbs, smash into the face. Don't make this some big technical issue. If I'm with violent intent driving forward, 
I don't need to make this a big deal. You don't really need specific... Te- if you're really driving forward into that guy and you want to hit him, what he does with his hands is not really your concern. Just get them out of the way in the simplest way possible. So I just gave you two options there. Okay, moving into the next phase. How do you deal with somebody delivering a preemptive strike? So you've got your hands down, you're not really ready. A preemptive strike in this, in this scenario, if you throw that right cross again, this is an ambush attack that comes from the front. That's basically what it is. So you're always in damage control and you've got to be prepared. You might get hit, you might get dinged, but you don't want to get knocked out. So you're going to try and get to a GCR so that you can then fight back if you can. But more important than fighting back, if he's taken the initiative and you're now on the defensive, at this particular point in the fight, and probably at no other, more than this point, I must focus on not getting knocked out. I need, my whole world needs to become this jaw and protecting this jaw. If I don't think he's really going to go for it, or I'm switched off, or I don't realise that I think we're in a verbal argument and he's decided to take it physical and I haven't realised and I'm standing like a farmer at a gate. I never stand like this, I don't know why I'm doing this for the DVD. Let's imagine I am, switched off, hands in pockets, holding something. So this will represent, you know, the fact that I'm holding on something or I'm not ready. If that hand comes and starts to make that punch, I have to move the target. That's all I can do. I can't stop his weapon. If, it's, if, if he's here and my point of awareness is here and I've got like a fraction of a second before contact, I'm not stopping his weapon. I can't preemptively move to stop um, the source of where the weapon's coming from. And I can't stop the man. It's too late. The, what are the last two things we can do? You should be stopping the man, stopping the weapon, then you're into damage limitation. Move the target, and the very last option, cover the target. So from here, if my hands are down, I can't cover the target, can I? I have to move it, so I'm going to have to do this. I could try and get my shoulder up as a, as a, as a response. What we don't want is, throw again, this, oh fuck, massive panic, hands flying up in the air, head thrown backwards this way. It needs to be controlled. Now the reason, when I'm boxing, I'm big on head movement for dealing with their punches. If I'm going to box with somebody in the ring, I don't worry too much about what my hands are doing. Very, very occasionally, if you throw that again, I'll give a little flick. Just, and I keep reminding myself, keep it small. Because if you don't, you'll overcompensate. And if I miss that and it goes past, he can then hit me. You know, you, you end up in all kinds of trouble. Best thing to do is move your head. So in boxing, I'd say just lay back. Why can't I teach you to do that in the street? Because in the street, with the adrenaline, your movements will be exaggerated and you don't know what's behind you. In the ring, I know what's behind me. Nothing. In the street, if somebody's in front of me and I throw my head back, I could end up headbutting somebody behind me or throwing it into a wall. But in this scenario where we're defending from a preemptive strike, try and get your hands up, throw again, and move the target. But rather than, if you see what I just did there, rather than doing what I do in boxing, which is this, so I can immediately come back and counter, I'm going to try and move my whole body back and do it. The movement that I'm coming to here against the right cross is my left shoulder to my chin, so that that right cross contacts into the shoulder, it's not going to knock me out, and I'm coming here. Now, where do you see this movement? There are two styles where you see this movement, and I think it's a fucking good defensive uh, position. One is Tai Chi, and it's here, and the other is boxing, which is here. So both of these styles use this movement. It's very, very ergonomically efficient, guys. So as a way of dealing with a preemptive attack, that's not a bad way to go. What if the preemptive attack is coming with a shorter range movement? What if it's the headbutt? Do you have a headbutt at anybody? Straight in. So the head's going to come, it's going to come below the line of my eyes, and it's going to drive forward this way. It's the same kind of thing, we're into damage limitation, especially if he's grabbed my lapels, and he's a big strong lad, now I've got trouble, now I'm in real trouble. What can I not allow? I can't allow this head to smash through my jaw, because it'll knock me out. Defensive priority number one, do not get knocked out. When you're knocked out, and you hit the deck, you get stamped on. What do I do from here? I'm going to have to try and move the target backwards and cover the target at the same time. And it's going to be a real oh shit movement. The good thing is, even though this is really, really powerful, it's short. It's a very, very short weapon. So I only have to come back a couple of inches and it's gone. His his technique's gone. 
I've actually been hit in fights. It still hurts with headbutts, but because I've moved, grab again, sorry, because I've moved back, even though the contact is in, it's come at the last portion of his headbutt. So his headbutt might only have, say, an effective penetrative range of about, I don't know, the total movement, maybe like five inches. So if you put your palm up from here, so if this is the target, from here, one, two, three, four, five, that's the effective range of the movement. Once it goes past that, once you're out of that range, there's nothing the other guy can do. Covering the target, if you grab and headbutt again, you should be trying to get your hands up. You should be trying to get your hands up as quickly as you can. Why? Because this is your GCR. Use the tabaki, uh, Thai Tabaki principle I gave you in the last DVD. Sink and strike. I am not in danger of a headbutt if I can get to here. Sorry. If I can get down to here and use my whole body to step back and get my hands up, he's not headbutting anybody. If you stay here and stiffen up when he grabs you, if when he grabs you, you go, oh, we're in, a, we're in a, a wrestling match. I need to use my upper body strength against his. Look at the fucking size of him. That's not going to play out very well, is it? I've got to use my intelligence. So I've got to step back and get hands to head if I can. And if I fail to do so, grab me again and headbutt. I've just got to try and move my head out of the way. This is not elegant. This is not pretty. But we're in damage limitation now. These are the kinds of things I would do to people. Sneaking up on them, trying to either friend them up or verbally scare them so that they're frozen, so I can bang them, so I can headbutt them. Next thing we're going to look at, which I've showed you to do on a few DVDs, is eye gouging. So if I could borrow your hand for a second. So the hand comes up to here and then the thumb slips into the tear duct side of the eye. Now I've also said it's not something to get too panicky about because I've eye gouged people, thumbs gone around the back of the eye and there's been no permanent damage. But, if I'm unlucky and his uh, thumbnail rakes the cornea, which is the little flap over the pupil at the front of your eye, and that gets damaged, there's no fixing it. You'll have, you'll have a damaged eye for life. So we can't just afford to go, oh, this isn't going to kill me, fuck it, I'll let him eye gouge me. You need to move. How are you going to move away from the eye gouge? As with anything that is using um, like a mauling principle that has no percussive impact but is just using the hand, you need to get both your hands to that one hand at the point of where it's making contact and rip the target away from it and you need to do that as quickly as you possibly can. What a lot of people do is they don't realise that it's happening. You've only got fractions of a second. The thing you do is screw your, screw your eye up, turn your head away. Pull it away from the target. If you pull the target away, if you, if you push the weapon and pull the target, you're going to be safer. So as that hand comes up, I need to be here. The quicker I can do that, the better. If it's in and he's got his hand around the, the back of my head trying to pull me into it, then it's both hands here and I need this away from my fucking face. You, use, you know, you've then got to start prioritizing. I'm going, get this away from your face. Sink your weight and move. And the other thing that I've shown you is this thing that I've called mauling. And a, a few people do this in different formats. Somebody said the other day, oh, this is Rich Dimitri's technique, the shredder. Rich Dimitri took this as a shredder and made it into a, to what we know it as today, and he took it very, very far. But technically speaking, if you want to get historical, it actually comes from Tony Blower. Tony Blower had a concept called the, sh um, the blender, and uh, he was talking about back in the late 90s, I've, got, I've still got the, D uh, the video, not even a DVD, about face raking as an incidental strike. As Tony Blower was describing it, it would be face raking in and across to then drive him with an elbow to face rake again into a palm. If you've seen Rich Dimitri's stuff, its hands go to the head and then he has, there are five principles that make the shredder what it is. If you're interested in looking, I can recommend his material, it's good stuff. I can recommend Tony Blau's material, also good stuff. But before both of those guys, in the old jiu-jitsu days, there was Shaco Ken. Bang, straight into the face and grinding into the face. It's like a couple of hundred years old. That's old uh, pre-Budo stuff called Bougay. Um, when you're using this stuff or somebody's using it against you, again it's a trick. The eye gouge is a trick. It's to, it's to make you think, oh fuck, my eye's going to be popped and to pull away. This is about overstimulating the soft sensitive tissue in the face, which is the, psychologically is the seat of the personality and driving the person's head away and back. That's what this is about. And they move the hands all over the face to make it as, as overwhelming as possible. And what I've shown you to do is to go from that into, into attacking into the eyes, round it into the throat, turning the head, and then dragging it down for chokes and uh, head controls and takedowns. 
But it is a little bit of a trick. Because if the hands are moving quickly, the damage that they're going to be doing is fairly limited. The objective is to make the other guy go, oh fuck, 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 and panic. If you put your hands to my face, if the hands are on my face, even if they're moving around and I gouging all different targets, I don't have to go, oh, oh, and start flapping. If the hands come to my face, grab the fucking hands and get them off your face. Again guys, it's about violent intent. It's about not letting the person run their game plan on you. As soon as either hand comes to the face, you should be thinking, how can I fucking get this off and get back to hurting him again as quickly and efficiently as I possibly can? These things aren't, uh, they're not undefeatable. No technique is undefeatable. They're very, very useful as incidental transitional strikes against your average thug in the street. But they've got to be used within fractions of a second. And once you've lost that element of surprise, say with the fence and preemptive strike. If I fence, preemptive strike, and then go, and he doesn't go down, and I step back and try and do it again, he knows what I'm doing. I may as well have my hands here now. I may as well just box with him. Because I've lost that. This is about the element of surprise. Listen, mate, I don't want to fight you. Bang. But if I go, listen, mate, I don't want to fight you. Bang. And then come back again and go, listen, mate, I don't want to fight you. He, he now knows what the fuck I'm doing, right? <laughs> so it's the same thing with mauling. If these hands go to the face and they're moving, 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 and he doesn't move to the next technique, I'm going to realise, shit, he's not really doing anything but stressing me out. So these hands, just either take two, two hands on one, and turn your face away from the other one, or get hold of both the hands, and just fucking rip them off your face. Just take them, fuck off, stop doing that. It's relying on panic, it's relying on twitchiness, and it's relying on people um, flapping. That's what you're trying to induce as a flap. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at that I've advocated you doing is uh, not from the mauling phase, it's the next phase, which is then the crush and the stamp. So crushing, what I'm going to ask you to do is just grab the back of my head, front of my throat, and then just pull my head down there. So this is the position that we're going for. We're trying to get that guy's head to go down, preferably even lower than this, so his head is lower than his center of gravity, so that he can then be pulled to the floor. Please don't pull me to the floor. I'm not ready. Um, very, very powerful technique, especially against somebody who's strong. If they've got a really good tight grip on you, you're in a lot of trouble. Again, what are we going to do here? Usually, I tell you to attack the man, but we're now looking at this defensively. The other guy is using the attack the attacker principle against me. He's now stealing every opportunity he can. Every gap he sees in my defense, he's filling up. So I can't use the attack the attacker principle against him if he's already there. So to stop him, I can't attack the man. If I'm in that position and I'm here, it would be really, really foolish of me to go, oh I know, I'll try and knock him out. That's just going to make things way, way worse for me. I have to attack his weapons. I have to. Now from this position, I could go for the top hand, I guess, but this is quite difficult and awkward. This is just a case of leaning. If I can get both my hands here to his wrist, well, I'm already down, I'm already facing downward. I just lean in, use my head, use my hands, and just use, use my own body weight. He's put his hand there. He's, the position I showed you to do, the reverse C grip is here, right? So I've already put my hand there. If instead of flapping or clawing at the clawing at the hands isn't going to do shit. If you've got good grip strength and somebody claws at your hands, you'll knock them out with the C grip before they claw your hand off. But what you're less likely to do is if the guy actually grabs with both of his hands on your wrist and pulls down, or as I just showed you, use his head, this then becomes a problem. Go again. If I'm here and I start driving with my head, look at his knees, look at his hips. I'm now taking him off balance. He doesn't want that. This is some, um, it's, kind of the, it's kind of similar to Filipino wrestling, like Dumog style, where they put massive amounts of pressure on the forearm. So by dragging his wrist towards me and folding down with my head, I can almost get a throw. I'm not advising you to get throw, throws, guys. I'm trying to show you ways of getting out. But it's good for you to understand the principles of leverage that can be applied here. So if we go back there, from here, he's then going to try and pull my head forward and towards him. If I allow this to happen, I'm going to be in trouble. Go again, sorry. If I just try and resist, all the strain is going in my neck. As I say, you know, a, a guy who trains, who's been lifting the weights, 
Do I want a fucking 100 kilogram man yanking my head like that as I try and base out and go, go on then, where's all the pressure gone? It's all gone here, straight in the neck. We can't afford that. So you must have a good base that is light and prepared to move. Grab hold again. So as he yanks forward and back, I need to go with it, but I need this foot, my front leg, my front leg must stay underneath me and in front of me so that I don't go down to the ground. Grab again. Try and stay in shot. And uh, step backwards and just pull my head to the floor. Here, this will happen if you don't keep your feet in front of you. To stop yourself from going to the ground, this must be here. This will stop me from going to the ground and getting stamped on. And at the same time as doing that, you're here and you pull this off. Just pull it away and then you go back to your core game plan. So you pull that off, bang, 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 and you go back into smashing him up. Another thing, the blast phase. Uh, you've never boxed before, have you? A little bit. Um, could you gently do a jab, cross, and an uppercut? Bang, bang, bang. Okay. So somebody's boxed before, and they're going to blast you, and they're going to be aiming for your jaw or your chin. That's quite dangerous, because theoretically, a good boxer can throw um, six or seven solid strikes within about three seconds, and any one of them could knock you out. Even professional boxers don't have the hand to eye coordination to see every individual shot and react to it. I know sometimes it looks like they are, but it's not possible, it's not physiologically possible. What they're, what they're um, proactively defending against is the next likely attack. So I know that if he throws a left jab, he's probably going to then throw a right cross. He's probably, if he contacts with that left jab, if I've hit him with a left jab and I've contacted, it's less efficient for me to come back out left jab again than to just throw the hand that has the most power and the most knockout potential. So they're, they're guessing, and sometimes they gamble and they guess wrong. You'll see people in a flurry, if you just punch, 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 they punch, 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 and then they think that they've seen a twitch or that something's coming for an uppercut, and they change and then they get hooked, bang, and they get knocked out because they're responding to something that's not there. Pretty scary. This is why I advocate, learn how to box. Get some good hands on you. Get some good fucking hands on you guys. Get some good hand to eye coordination, good speed, some good knockout power. You can end the fight in a second. It's very difficult to um, defend against a good boxer's flurry. So we have to kind of blag it a little bit. You need movements that can actually stop a wide variety of his attacks. And the only thing that I've found that has any chance of working is covering, doing the tie uh, cover. You need to get really good at this. Stand there, and I'll show you a drill how to do this uh, maybe later on in this DVD or another DVD, and you've actually got to get good at covering this way. It's not elegant, it's not pretty. I'm sure you'd, we'd all rather be ducking and dodging and throwing our heads around with stuff that looks cool. But you, in a street fight, bad lighting, dance floor, people pushing into us, fucking dry ice going, strobes going, you can't fucking be seeing what he's doing. You've got to just cover in a way where if I think he flinches that side, I'm here. If I think he flinches that side, I'm here. Go again, here. And every single time I do this, I am moving forward into his face. I never want to see anybody doing this and coming back. For a puncher, the same as a knifer, space is opportunity. If he's got a knife or he's trying to punch me, it's the same, it's the same thing guys, he's trying to bring his hand towards my body. Space is opportunity. So if he punches, I must not come away. Because what, what have I gained? Oh, I stopped that one, but now I've got the next one and the next one. If he punches and I step in, I've stopped that. Where's his next punch going to come from if I'm driving through him and I've taken him to a different range? And you are going to have to clinch. If the, if the uh, throw two punches, so we go clinch, clinch, and in, then once you come inside, then we can come back to our little bag of tricks, the mauling, the biting, the fucking knees, the headbutts, drag to the floor, okay? Take him out of the range where he wants to be. The last technique we're going to look at, uh, something that Danny asked me, um, it's actually a two in one. One is, what if you get shoved? Fucking, I hate getting shoved. 
It's one of these things that's actually quite hard to deal with. Anybody can do it. Um, it's a very, very raw technique. If you remember the old Beta 8 syllabus, I actually showed you techniques from Tai Chi on shoving. One was called Iron Mountain. I'm not going to do it. Which is this position that I showed you before. The, the boxes and the, and the Tai Chi position. And you drive, bang, with that farging energy straight into the target to drive him backwards. The other thing the Tai Chi guys are fucking experts at is these pushes. You know, first move of Tai Chi. So it's like one of the, or maybe the third move of Yang style Tai Chi. It's a big fucking push. Why? Why would you push somebody? Boys and girls, if we're fighting, not in the gym, but in the real world, there's shit in the real world. There's bins, there's cars, there's buses, there's people. You, if you fucking can, if you, it's a well worthwhile skill. Learn how to do the Iron Mountain, how to drive somebody back, and learn the Tai Chi push. Develop your chest strength, develop your back strength, develop your arm strength with weights and then get with another human being and just practice with one of your mates or if you're an instructor with your students in the gym, driving somebody across the room. It's a fucking powerful technique. You know, and what these, what the, uh, what the old Tai Chi masters would do is they start the push from here. This is how close they are and then they'll push up and down. The energy is like a rolling wave. It goes up and down and then in. And you fuck somebody up, especially if you drive them into a wall. How do you defend against that? It's a pain. Okay, we're not talking about Tai Chi masters now. We're talking about some yob in a club who goes, fuck you, man. Fuck you. You've got to be fast. Because as I say, even if you're a trained martial artist or you're strong and, and, and fit and whatever, just push me in the chest. So I'm standing with my feet parallel, got my drink in my hand, uh, I'm, in, I'm in the VIP area where they have those fucking annoying low, every club does this, low seats with no backs to them. Listen mate, just calm down, shove me, bang, oh fuck, I'm over the seat, I've stacked it into the bottle of champagne and I've landed in my girlfriend's lap. Now I feel foolish. What did he do? <laughs> So, <laughs> you've got to be fast with this stuff. So you, with all the attacks, you've got to try and stop it before it starts, right? As the hands come up to push, you must... If you can stop one hand, you can stop both of them. Remember what I said to you about pushing the hands out of the way? As that hand comes up, use that Tai Chi... Uh, not Tai Chi... Silat fire energy. The hand comes up, slap that fucker out of the way and make it explosive. As I said to you in the last DVD, go real slow. So we're here. Pop the hand. Pang! And I want to hear, pang, on his arm. Use that core, you're gritting your core, and off this explosive movement, bang, he's, he might have pushed me once, but he's not pushing me a second time. Because once I've gone through and in, I'm here. And we're back to different range, different series of techniques. If you can stop one hand, you can stop them both, because you're driving this limb. A, you're driving this limb into the other limb, but basic physiology. If I've controlled this side of his, the upper part of his torso, I have turned him. So the only way that that wouldn't work is if you push, push my hand, if I've come across here, my hand will automatically do that unless I start splitting. Splitting my strength, which would be weird. <laughs> Not many human beings will move like that. Not many human beings will go, oh, and keep going with it. They'll fight for their own balance because otherwise they're gonna throw themselves off balance. Shoving is difficult. Um, if you've already been shoved and it's too late, the hands are already on and you're already flying backwards, try and sink. Come back to this, uh, the ninjutsu stance. Try and sink. If you can, but if you're too late, you're too late. If, the, if I'm standing and the chair is there and he's got this, I'm tumbling. I'm, I'm going to the deck and it's like, okay, let's get this drink away from me. I'm going to try and not kick somebody in the face. I'm going to try and not get any glass in my head. But I'm going to go down because it's physiology. It doesn't matter how much of a fucking chubby ninja you are. <laughs> if there's something there and a guy shoves you, you're going to fall. The only thing you can hope for is to get back up and knock him out before anybody notices. Um, wait. <laughs> the, the shoving was, was the second to last one. The final, final technique is this thing of when people do like a rugby tackle, the untrained rugby tackle. Or I was asked what if they do a trained... Um, a trained double leg takedown. Okay, first thing I should mention about trained double leg takedowns, they're not great for the street because my knees versus the concrete, it's not going to work well. I think, I think I'm right in saying, I don't really like these things, but you're supposed to come down. Let me think, how are you supposed to do it? You're supposed to drive down with your knee and you're supposed to try and get in between his feet by driving your knee to the floor. 
I've got to be honest with you guys, this isn't my bag, as I'm sure you can tell. Drive right down, grab them behind the knees and lift them up. And lift them up, there you go. Why Wang's not white, mic'd up, but he said, uh, drop, you, you level change, get behind the knees and lift them up. But the whole point of it is to uh, shove their centre of gravity, and you're supposed to do that by putting your knee to the floor. Grab and in and shove. Uh, it doesn't work unless they've been pushed and they're, they're off balance. What you'll sometimes see is untrained guys doing this. Uh, uh, it's too late. It's too late. The, um, just put your arms out like that. I'm just going to hit you there. It's this. You must hit that first in order to get it to work. But on the street with your knees, it's not ideal. So what you'll get people doing is like a shitty variation of it where they'll come here like a rugby tackle or they'll try and come here. Um, even if they do a full one, it doesn't matter, we respond the same way. Our response is we'll take it from the wrestlers, because the wrestlers are the guys most qualified to deal with this kind of attack. We'll take it from the MMA guys, because they're the ones most qualified to deal with this. If you shoot down for a double leg, what they do is a sprawl. <laughs> it's real simple. That the hips shoot back, the leg shoots back, so if I'm here, I can very easily be pulled and driven to the floor if both my legs are together. If they're split, it's much harder to get a double leg, but he could switch it to a single leg and pick that up. So we don't want that either. So what you've got to actually do is you've got to split his head from his hands. And the way you do that is by shoving his head backwards and as his hands reach, you're causing a split because I'm moving this target away, pulling it backwards. So that's the basics, basic dynamics of the sprawl. In a street scenario, when that shit starts to happen, if you go for that again, you need to start inflicting pain straight away. So my hand must come into his face for a preemptive strike, we must be gouging into the face, and then either coming straight in for a neck crank, or um, a reverse C grip, and then you've got to drag him to the floor. Don't, especially a big dude who's like, oh, I quite fancy wrestling with you. On concrete, do you want to be suplexed? I fucking don't. Get your weight down. Don't start coming up here. If you, if you go to tackle me again, if I panic and my weight comes up, I'm fucked. I'm going to be on the deck. Even if, even if all this guy knows is rugby. If he knows rugby, he knows well enough to drive, 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 drive and pull, even if he pulls my trousers to get my leg up or just yank here and turn it, he'll get me to the floor. So bring your arse closer to the floor and split your legs. As I said to you on the last DVD, I'm seeing too much of this. Straight legs, feet close together, people moving here. Drop your weight. Let's get back into the old school ninjutsu ways, the old school tai chi ways and karate ways, and let's get down. Let's get down lower in training. If in application, you can take somebody out and keep your center of gravity high, then cool. That's a good thing. Much more expedient, much more efficient, but don't allow that to become a model for laziness in the dojo and in the gym. Move your feet, sink your weight, and use committed movement. Okay guys, that's the uh, core game plan deconstructed. Thanks, sir.